Father, again, we do ask your blessing upon the word. And Lord, we ask that you would draw our hearts into the revelation of your heart. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, this is session two. And this is the five seasons. The five seasons, or actually the five prophetic seasons. As God trains leaders. These are the five seasons, the five prophetic seasons in God's training strategy for leaders or for ministries. The life of David, the 70 years of David's life, he was king for 40 years, is broken down into five very significant seasons because in this uh, pattern of David's life, we understand the prophetic seasons that God takes us through and the reasons he takes us through them, through those seasons in order to bring us to a place of, of training and maturity and leadership. Each of these five prophetic seasons are related to five different cities of David's life. The five cities being Bethlehem, Gibeah, Adullam, Hebron, and Jerusalem, as the notes uh, communicate there. Each one of these cities, again, is related to a, a, a specific, very strategic thing that God's training in David's life. Not that there's only one. There's actually a, 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 a manifold purpose of God in each one of those seasons. There's many facets to, to what God wants in each season, but there's a primary thought or two of which God is wanting to bring forth in that season. In the first season, in the Bethlehem years, what the Lord wants David to do is he's beginning the journey of gazing on the beauty of the Lord. And as we'll look at next week, I believe that David wrote Psalm 19 when he's looking at creation. He's seeing the beauty of the Lord in creation. He's seeing the beauty of the Lord is revealed in the, in the written word of God. And it's in those early days where the Lord is beginning to draw David into that man after God's own heart kind of relationship. That God wants David to derive his, his meaning in life from being loved by God and being a lover of God. A phrase that I've said for some time now that I'm loved and I'm a lover, therefore I'm successful. And that's a phrase that I've worked out from the life of David and from the life of the Apostle John. Putting together different phrases and, and putting together different principles and, and, uh, episodes in their in various lives. That's the most summary, brief way that I can say it. That God wants us to derive our primary identity from spiritual truth. He wants our primary identity to be a spiritual identity of who we are in the Lord. And that's what He's establishing in the Bethlehem years. As He's revealing, as we'll look at in Psalm 19, the beauty of creation. He's revealing the beauty of God revealed in the Logos, the Word of God, or the Torah in David's uh, uh, context, his setting. When we know that we're loved, and we know that we're lovers of God, that's who we are. Though we struggle, we're not hopeless hypocrites. We are, in fact, lovers of God. That in the midst of our struggle, when the enemy calls us hypocrites and failures or tries to tell us he defines us by our sins, he defines us by our shortcomings, we say no and we define ourselves by the cry in our spirit to be a lover of God. One of them is how God feels about us. The second one is about how we live before God. I may stumble and fall, but at the core of my being, the cry of my heart is to be a lover of God. And that's what defines me. I am not defined by my shortcomings. I'm defined by the cry in my spirit back to God. That is the primary spiritual, the primary identity that God wants to build into David's life. That's the primary identity that God wants to build into your life in the early days of your spiritual life. It's the thing that is most common uh, experiences, most believers don't really enter, enter into that in the early days. They don't see the beauty of the Lord in the natural arena of life, and they don't see the beauty of the Lord in the revealed Word of God. And therefore, they can't see the beauty of the grace of God in their own lives and who they are as a lover of God. We are loved and we are lovely to God. We are loved and we are lovely. 
emotionally, therefore we are lovers. That's really how it boils down emotionally. And so God wants to d develop this in David's life. God has ordained that we have a primary identity, which is our spiritual identity, what we look like to God. But it's also true that we have a secondary identity, our natural identity, what we look like to people. Our primary identity is what we look like to God. Our, sp our secondary identity, our natural identity, is what we look like to people. And that's the arena of our, of our finances. We have a lot of money, we look good to people. It's the arena of our skills and abilities. If we're real talented or gifted in a particular area, whether you're brilliant in some uh, intellectual skill in life or whether your hands are skilled in some form of, you know, uh, 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 some kind of craft or of, of some artistic ability, it doesn't really matter. People typically derive their meaning and their identity by their skills, whether they're mental or, or physical skills, whether they're a great athlete, a great singer, they can build things real good, they can design things real good, they can figure things out real smart. They define their life and their value by their skills. Others define their life and their value by their physical conditioning. If they're, they have real pretty looks or their condition of their body or they're a great athlete, others by the relationships. If they hang around with the rich and the famous, then they kind of derive a certain meaning by hanging around with the, quote, successful people. There's many ways that we derive our, our secondary identity, and those secondary identities are really a part of our life. We cannot repent from them having some impact on us. God just wants them to be secondary, that's all. He wants us to be successful because of the fact He loves us and because of who He is and what we are to Him. That's where He wants our identity. When I mean our identity, what I mean by our deriving our identity is how we define why we're successful. That's what I mean by our identity. What is it, at the end of the day, when you can finally say, yes, I am successful, what is the definition where you can lay in your bed at night and say, yes, I am successful? That's what I mean by your identity. However you answer that is the way you identify your life. It's the way you define, you derive your value and your meaning and your purpose. Most people derive their value, their meaning, their purpose. I'm using those somewhat synonymously. Their value, their meaning, their purpose. They define their successful because of the money, because of the gifts, because of their physical condition, because of the relationships they have with other people the position they have in the company or the ministry, and if those things are favorable and natural in the natural uh, uh, value system, then they feel successful. But that's a lie. You're successful in the most dynamic, absolute sense of the world, uh, word because He loves you, because you're the object of His love and you said yes to it, and because there's been an emerging, budding impulse of your heart by the Spirit of God. You're a lover of God. You want to love Him back. Therefore, the thief on the cross is one of the most successful human beings of all of history. He's one of that, quote, whatever billion of history, of the 10 or 20 billion of history. He's one of the very small remnant of the human race that accepted the free love of God in the most embryonic way, but he did exist. That beginning bud of love in his heart back for God. He steps over the line of physical death. He awakes up in paradise and he understands that he's a king. He goes, no one ever told me I was a king. And I'm a bride. I'm a queen as well. He's over all the angels. He's crowned in glory before God forever and forever. He said yes to the love of God. And he said yes to becoming a lover of God. In the most embryonic way, he gazed at the beauty of the Lord and a little bit responded to the outworking of that beauty in his own life. That's what makes us successful. The Lord knows that David will never be he will never be a safe king, a safe leader until his identity is in the Lord and not in what he does. And we're going to find David through his life the most remarkable thing. David derives his meaning and value by who, how God feels about him, what he, what, what, what the truth of God and what he looks like to God. What God feels about him and what he looks like to God and how he responds to God, that is where he's going to derive the essence of what his life is about. So his whole kingdom is being threatened and taken away from him in the reign, I mean in the, in the, uh, 
the treachery of his son Absalom, and he says, oh, but I don't care. Let him have it. I'm the Lord. So he says, I, got, I, I didn't really want to be king. That really wasn't what I signed up for. I gazed on the beauty of the Lord. I began a journey in my youth, gazing at the stars in Psalm 19 as a young shepherd boy. And I was captured by the beauty of creation, the beauty of the Word of God, the little that I knew. And I said, that's what I am and that's what I want more of. All the days of his life is what he sought and that's what he wanted in the past and in the present. Psalm 27, 4. And in the Bethlehem days, there's a number of things that happened in those first seasons. The Lord's working on David, revealing the beauty of the Lord to David, revealing David's beauty and David's loveliness back to God, uh, capturing David's heart, enthralling David with God and understanding. David began to understand God was enthralled with him and David had a sense of well-being and fulfillment on the inside of him before anything ever happened. He was already successful before he began any of the seasons. That's what the Lord's plan was. Now, in those early days, there's a number of things the Lord puts in front of you. One thing that happens, he I don't have this on the notes, but he tests you. He develops that identity by putting, he wants you to be faithful in the midst of the mundane. Faithful in the midst of the mundane. People all imagine being faithful when they stand before thousands or they administrate millions. They somehow imagine one day they will wake up faithful before thousands of people and overseeing millions of dollars and great influence. But between now and then, well, all this other stuff is boring. And besides, nobody's looking anyway. What does it matter? And the Lord is wanting us to derive our pleasure in life, our identity, our pleasure in life from being loved and a lover so the mundane doesn't break us. The mundane doesn't cause us to lose our way before the Lord. Because we actually have pleasure. Thank you, Matt. We actually have pleasure. The, the, the greatest way you can do the mundane without complaint overtaking your heart is when you're doing it for Him and with Him and unto Him. And that's what the great servants of the Lord have all found through history. The ability to commune with God in the mundaneness of life, the boring things that nobody gives them any credit for or attention for. Nobody ever notices them, but they don't care because the reward is already pulsating through their heart. The reward, they're feeling the reward day by day. David's out taking care of the sheep. You know what? The sheep, the people that took care of the sheep were the very lowest, the very lowest on the scale. The servants took care of the sheep because, I mean, you had to be out in the elements. You've got Cold and hot and wet and you're stuck out there. All by yourself. And wild animals came up and, you know, well, we lost that guy. You know, the animals came, you know. I mean, the main guys didn't do the shepherding stuff. They didn't go out there with the sheep because the elements was too intense. I mean, imagine somebody says, you're going to take care of the lawn, but you're going to stay out outside for seven years. I mean, literally, that's what the shepherds did. David was, I mean, this is a very, very powerful thing. David was so low on the economy of his family. This is not a joke. This is real. That when We'll look at this a little bit of this next week, possibly. When David's, when Samuel, the prophet, comes to little Bethlehem, 300 people in the town, I mean, the man of God, the most famous man of God in the world, the known world of that time would have been Samuel. He was known all over Israel and even from the, in the nations beyond. He spoke and earthquakes came and storms came at his word. I mean, the mystique around Samuel was amazing. The most famous spiritual leader, the man next to God, the man like the closest to Moses in that generation, comes to visit their house. And he says, I want all of your sons here. The Lord has sent me. And the father, Jesse, won't even have David come. The seven brothers come and David's the eighth and he is not invited. And as Samuel looks, as the prophet looks at each of the seven brothers, wants to anoint one of them king, and, and as most of you know the story in 1 Samuel 16, he looks and he's going to anoint the first one. The Lord says no. The second one, the Lord says no. The third one, he says, do you have any other sons? And Jesse says, well, I, I, I mean, technically, yes, but I mean, I mean, it's David. And they kind of rolled their eyes. No, you're Samuel. This is David. He says, well, bring the kid in here, you know, and. So David stands before him, and the Lord says, that's the one. And but here, when, David, when Samuel looks into David's eyes, 
He's not looking at the guy longing for a destiny. He was looking into the only man in that whole group who actually was enjoying where he was. He looked at the, in the eyes of the only one that was settled and at peace on the inside. And that was the king. He says, you're the only one who doesn't care about it because you're already lost in something else. You're the one that God has chosen. You know a little bit what God looks like. And you know a little bit what you look like to God. Therefore, you can tend sheep with a song in your heart. Because the sheep isn't what you're doing. You're singing when you're out there. You're interacting with the God of the universe, the Psalm 19 God that I believe he wrote at that season of his life. Faithful in the mundane. You know why the mundane crucifies us? Because there's no pleasure in it. Because we can't find God in the present tense. We have to find God in novelty. More money, more power, more cool people, more exciting circumstances. And finally, that craving for rest and pleasure is at peace. And the Lord says, you know what? You're not going to find it in any of those things. You're only going to find it in me. That's technically... What, it, what Psalm 90 verse 1, the Lord's my dwelling place, means. So David was the only one, when he looked in his eyes, was actually at rest. He was actually the only one actually enjoying the Lord. The only one that actually had a song in his heart, and he had the most difficult circumstances of everyone. Everybody else was looking for some novelty to prop them up, to take the pain away from the boredom and the mundaneness of their life, which was really an indication of their spiritual uh, boredom. Our boredom in life is spiritual boredom. We think our boredom is lives. We need to meet some more cool people, have some more money to spend or oversee, have more anointing to work with. Our boredom at the very core is spiritual. It's with God. Because when the man or the woman is enthralled with God, the issue before them is not the big issue. That's what's going on in David's life. Faithful in the mundane, enjoying the Lord in the mundane. Therefore, the mundane is not a burden to him. I've had times in my life where I, enter, I, I touch this and lose this and touch this and lose this. I've had times when the mundane, I could just so enjoy the Lord. And other times where even the exciting was tormenting because I couldn't connect with the Lord in the way I did even in the other seasons. There's no circumstance that can satisfy the craving of your heart made for God. We're always looking. And most people in the church think it's in the ministry somewhere. Then the anointed people thinking something good and anointed about you, that's really never going to take away the cry of your heart. I know X amount of anointed guys out there, and some of them are the most spiritually bored, absolutely broken inside, discontent, angry people. I mean, I'm talking about some famous guys. I know there's only one place, and God does this in David's life, he finds the song in the secret place. It doesn't matter what he's doing. The second part about the Bethlehem season, it's the time when the prophetic promises were given. It's the time when the prophetic promises were given. And faithfulness was required in the mundane, or the ability to enjoy God in the mundane is a better way to say it. Samuel comes in, says you're going to be, you're going to have this kind of impact. But God doesn't want your identity in that promise. God, you're not famous, you, you're not gonna be successful and happy because of these promises of being king. If you're not already successful and not already happy, being king will torment you and he'll torment the nation. That's what the Lord was telling David. That's the essence of it when you put the Psalms together. It's amazing, like I said already, it was, he's 17 years old approximately. He's not king over all Israel. For 20 more years he's not king over all Israel. Now David didn't know that. Nobody knew that. Season number one, establish your identity in being loved and a lover. The ability to enjoy God in the mundane. It's when the promises come. Those promises can torment you, not just excite you. I have been tormented by promises sometimes, not just empowered with hope. How many of you know that hope deferred makes the heart sick? I've had some hopes that it ended up I didn't, I didn't really... The expectations were not right. I did not steward it right, the understanding of it. And my heart was in one direction, and I ended up with a sick heart. And the Lord says, through that sickness of heart, He says, I just allowed you to be sick of heart because I want you to see your enjoyment is in what you're going to do one day, not in me. And I want it in me, not in what you think you're going to do one day. Mike, I want you to enjoy me regardless what you do. That's the key. I let you be heart sick because I want you to discover the greatest thing of life. I am enjoyable right now if you want me to be. 
Oh, but Lord, when the revival, the Lord says, that revival's really not going to satisfy you like you think it is. I will satisfy you today as much as I can then. Give yourself to me. See my beauty in creation and see my beauty in, in my word. In the natural revelation of creation and the spiritual revelation of the word of God, the beauty of the Lord, Psalm 19, is what I believe that God gave David in that season. Again, we'll look at that next week. Number two city, Gibeah. Gibeah is, is the capital at that time. It's where, it's where Saul, it's where the president of the nation lives. It's where the prime minister lives. Gibeah, it's Washington, D.C. in our context. Gibeah, David's identity is strengthened and tested and tested by early promotion. What happens? We know 1 Samuel 17, and we'll look at it in, more, in a lot more detail. He stands before Goliath. Now, we know Goliath is a children's church story, but, beloved, it's more than a children's church story. It, it is one of the most dramatic military crisis answered in a miraculous way in the history of the world, of all human history. Israel is going to be annihilated as their national existence is in the balance. This is for real. This is about like Israel right now and all the Arab nations breathing. I mean, they are going to be annihilated. Things are, are not going good under Saul. Saul's already been rebuked two times. The favor of the Lord's off of him. And there's a demon that's on Saul right now. Saul's demonized. The nation's in trouble. A nation led by a demonized leader is in big trouble. And that's where most of the nations of the earth are. It's trouble. They don't think right under pressure. They think crazy thoughts that wreck people's lives when they get under pressure. When they have demons leaning on them. Israel's in trouble. Saul is absolutely scared to death. Saul has lost all of his courage that was given him by the Spirit in the early years. The Philistines, they line up on one side of the valley, the, the uh, Israeli army on the other side. And the army of Israel is convinced they're going to lose. And they are going to lose. And here's what the Philistines are going to do. The Philistines have an accumulated rage against Israel that you can't imagine. They're going to kill the men. They are going to rape the women and enslave the children for life after this battle. This is serious. This is not a small thing. And David comes there to visit his, his older brothers who are in the military to bring them some, pre, uh, some bread and some food. And he hears this Goliath taunting the armies of Israel, the Spirit of the Lord that's been on David since Saul, Samuel anointed him. And a number of great things have happened. The Spirit of the Lord has been on him. And David, it's not that David just got a, 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 an emotion of courage. The Spirit of the Lord was on him. This was a divine opportunity, a divine setup. This was a sovereign setup. This wasn't just his natural everyday courage. This was a Spirit-empowered act of courage. Because as he says in 1 Samuel 17, he killed the lion and the bear two other times. This is after the anointings on him. A lion comes up and grabs a little lamb. David walks up to the lion as a 17, 18-year-old young man, 16, takes the lion and kills the lion. The Spirit of God's on this young man. This is after the anointing. And then a bear comes. He takes the bear out. David, and the reason he took the lion and the bear, God was building confidence, which is a spiritual principle. I don't want to go on a bunny trail, but God allows you to kill the giant and the bear before you face the giant. God says, I'm going to give you a couple little confidence boosters in the spirit before you face Goliath and the extermination of the nation of Israel. This is not just a children's church story. This is a serious military political crisis in the, in the history of Israel. He stands there and he goes, guys, the same spirit's on me. He didn't just say it that way, but that's what we understand is happening. He goes, uh, it's here, guys. The Lord's with me. The Lord is with me. I'm not afraid of that guy at all. Something they're looking at him and go, David, his brothers rebuked him and said, you're just an arrogant, arrogant, insolent, proud young man because Samuel prayed for you and you're just filled with pride is what his brother said. He says, well, I don't know about all that, but I'm going after that giant. I'm getting to the story ahead of time. But anyway, here's the point. Let's skip the story. He defeats the giant. The nation is so overwhelmed with joy that their, the calamity is over. It was a stunning supernatural victory. The USA Today, literally, the, the, in the streets, they were singing songs about David. 
He was on the front of USA Today. He moved to Washington, D.C. He moved to Gibeah. He moved to the king's court. He literally moved to the White House in our context. It's a 17-year-old boy. He says, oh, the young virgins of Israel were singing songs about David. I mean, imagine what would go to the head of an 18-year-old man when all the girls in the land were singing about him. He moves in with the president, front of USA Today. He's over all of his brothers. He's one of the main commanders in the army. He's over a 1,000 now. He's only 18 years old. He's over a 1,000 soldiers who've been in the army for years. The king loves him. I mean, the king sees no wrong in David. The king says, I'd love you to marry my daughter. David's identity is being tested early promotion. Now here's what David didn't know. And this is what, this is absolutely the pattern of God in the scripture. God gives early promotions to strengthen your identity and he's going to take that sphere of promotion away to strengthen it again. There's a verse in Proverbs 21. I don't have it just off the top of my head. It says that a man is tested according to the praise that's given to him. If any of you know it, just shout it out so we can Get it for the others. Proverbs 21, something or other. A man is tested according to the praise that's given to it. In other words, there's, there's a season in your life when everybody goes, you're incredible, you're incredible, you're incredible. And the Lord says, I'm testing your heart right now. Because if you get your identity, your sense of value, importance, and meaning from those statements, you're going to end up corrupted in a few years. And boy, I tell you, the girls were singing, the, the over a thousand soldiers, national calamity is averted. And David says, I, 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 this is all fun, but I love the Lord. I, I'm, I'm not into this. I, I don't mind doing it because it's the will of God, but I'm loved and I'm a lover. I'm enjoying something that's bigger than he headlines. Headlines are not what's driving me right now. The headlines will come and the headlines will go. David had no idea they were going to go very soon. It lasted about four or five years. And I've met so many people in ministry. And I've had this experience, uh, uh, to some degree in my own ministry, where the Lord has given a season of promotion, a season of prosperity. And we always think this because we're Westerners. We always think that more is better. We always think that when the curve goes up, it goes up until the end if God likes us. Well, God really liked David, and the curve took a sharp down. Westerners only can only have one comprehension of increase. John the Baptist said, I must decrease. That is a completely non-Western concept, to decrease with joy in the grace of God. We only think increase is good. But God's interested in David's heart as a voluntary lover increasing. He's interested in his identity becoming fiery and strong like iron in him so in the future he can be a blessing to the nation. He's 18 to 23, seems like David's whole life. But God says, no, David, you got lots of years. And one of the most powerful verses, one of the most powerful verses in uh, describing David, it says that God chose David. I, I can't get it, but we'll run into it uh, uh, a number of times because it's, it's a prominent one in my thinking. We'll run into it a number of times. I just can't remember where it's at this second. But David said, the, the Spirit of the Lord, I can't remember who sang it, if David sang it or Solomon, whoever, but it's saying that God chose David for the sake of his people Israel. Now, we think God chooses us for us. No, God chooses us for salvation for us and for him, but he gives us a ministry for others. Most people, they want this ministry so bad so they can be happy. But God's calling on David was never about David's happiness. God's Love affair with David was about David's happy, not his ministry. We're pained over our ministry decreasing and excited over it increasing because we imagine, we never put words to it, that an increased ministry is about our personal happiness. And God told David, me calling you into the sphere of kingship was never about you. It was about the blessing I would give to people with a man like you in the right place. Matter of fact, David, I'm going to beat the tar out of you between now and then to get you in a place where I can trust you because it's about the nation that I care about. But that revelation either came to David or Solomon. But we imagine the anointings of the greater. I'm going to be rich and famous and finally my mom will know I mattered. I amounted to something that's going to be great. And the Lord says, no, you got the wrong, totally wrong idea about why I just told you I'm going to anoint you. Chapter 27. Oh, it's Proverbs 27, verse 21. God tests a man according to the praise. Proverbs 27, verse 21. Thank you. Just counting on you. 
So in Gibeah, David finds out he's, he's got prosperity everywhere, but it's only for a moment. Oh, and how many men and women of God had a moment uh, in the light, and they started strutting, and they started getting their sense of feeling, joy, and enjoyment was related to the out. of blessing and the Lord says it's, that's never how it was supposed to be and David passed the test of promotion early promotion suddenly the Adolamirs begin Adolam is a city and there's a cave outside the city called the cave of Adolam David is operating out of the cave of Adolam approximately seven years we don't know exactly if it's 23 that's an approximation it's close though here's a man USA Today all the girls singing about him in the king's house now he's being chased from cave to cave for seven years. Beloved, I'm not talking about three months, you know, they lost their job. We're talking seven years. No income. Seven years. 3,000 of the choice soldiers of Israel with one commission. Forget fighting the enemies of Israel. Let the other 100,000 fight them. You 3,000 you assassinate David. That's your only mission. 3,000 against one. Go for it. The nation's not that big. You know, it's only about 100 miles by about 30. Go for it. Kill him. Anywhere. Go for it. I'll pay you extra. 3,000 men for seven years are chasing David. We look at some of David's compromise. I mean, my goodness, the guy has some serious pressure. The Adolamirs. David's identity is strengthened and it's, and it's uh, attested by adversity. By adversity. And it's a very different thing. Prosperity and adversity are very, very different. Mundaneness is very different than early promotion. And early promotion is very different than adversity. Three completely different kinds of wind blowing over his garden, if you will. You, The only way for comfort is David has to realign his heart. He has to say before the Lord, Lord. This pain is intense. Everybody's against me. I mean, David's brothers, his family. I mean, it was intense at every level. They're still in the army. They're still in Saul's army. He's mocked at it. It says in Psalm 69, he goes, I became a reproach to my family and all of my friends because I have zeal for God. He goes, my love for God has driven me to the place where my friends and families think I'm complete. They've written me off as being a fool and filled with pride. He goes, but I know it's real. Because David only got into trouble because he's doing the will of God with zeal. Guilelessly doing the will of God. But anyway, the only place you can find comfort in adversity is through realigning your mind with one truth. You, here's what adversity does. Oh, this pain, i got to get it fixed. Whether it's relational, economic, whether it's physical, whether it's your, your anointing, whether it's your loss of favor, your heart's going, ouch, pain, pain. And you go, how can I get the enjoyment of the early years? And then you ask the big question. You have to go to the big picture. Why am I living on planet Earth? What is life about? The uncreated, transcendent God filled with beauty. He loves me. He likes me. He is ravished for me. And I love Him. And it feels so right to love Him. I'm loved, I'm a lover, therefore I'm successful. In adversity, he aligns himself, and that becomes like iron forged within his soul. That reality, his identity is being strengthened like iron in him. It's like the fire being, it's being uh, uh, melted together. God's heart and his heart under the fire. And David comes to adversity. Yes, he blows it a number of times, but he always comes back to that center. Every chance to live by an identity, by some other definition of success besides the fact of enjoying the Lord. The Hebron years. This is kind of even more difficult than the others. It, it, they're all so different. That's why they're so significant. The Hebron years. Well, finally, seven years of wandering in the Adullam wilderness, or the cave of Adullam. Is, is, and he's not always in the cave of Adullam. He's in Ziklag for 16 months, but I'm just using the the uh, cave of Adullam as a center point of that season. But seven years. Can you imagine how tired you would be seven years later after doing this? I mean, seven years. I mean, you're, you've been in the palace for five. You know, it's like seven years. The promises are wearing on him day and night. He's thinking, you know, Lord, it's not really about being king. It's about being yours. All the days of my life, I've sought the beauty of the Lord, he said. This thing I've done. I, he did it in the past, and he set his heart to continue in the future. The beauty of the Lord. Well, finally, Saul dies when he's 30. This is the most amazing story, which we'll look at in more detail. Saul dies. 
David now has 600 soldiers that have, uh, and their families that have joined themselves to David. 600 of them. And they've heard the promises for years. David's going to be king over all 12 tribes and the power of God. And he's going to defeat all the nations. And it all really happens. Well, these 600 guys, they really get their identity from David's promises. They're not really connecting in the Lord in the same way. David, as some of them do, because some of them become mighty men of David, mighty men in the Lord. But a good handful of them, under the pressure of testing, when Saul was at the end of David's spear two times, the brethren said, David, kill him. The prophecy said God would deliver you. What do you want? This is the prophecy. Kill the guy. And David said, I can't kill him. He's the anointed of the Lord. He's demonized. God brought you there. He goes, no, God will have to kill him. I won't kill him. I won't kill him. And his men were quoting all the prophecies. Kill him, kill him. This is the hour of your deliverance. So we'll go through those stories in, de in some detail. So now, finally, God kills Saul. God killed him. That's what the scripture says. God killed him. Yes, it was in a battle, Mount Gilboa, but it's God who killed him. God says, finally, your seminary course is over. I've trained you in the most skillful, effective way under a demonized man. I've trained you deliberately. Now it's over. You've graduated. So now, the men say, well, you're king. Let's do it. And David, oh, I can see it now. In 2 Samuel, let's just look at it. 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1. David asks the great question. They're all saying, this is that. Saul's funerals happen. They go, there's nobody left. Saul has four sons, by the way. Saul's three sons died in battle. Saul has one other son named Ishbosheth, the son of shame. You know what Ishbosheth, his problem was? He didn't like war. He didn't want to go to battle. He said, Dad, you know, that kind of makes my stomach feel weird when people, like, stick each other with swords. I don't like it. So the three sons went to war and died with the father. And the only son, the only obstacle for David being king of all Israel is this kid who hates war, this young man who hates war. He goes, I, I don't, I'm not really made for that kind of stuff. David is the mighty warrior king of Israel, and the only obstacle is a guy who can't stand blood. Seriously. The top general, his name is Abner, comes to David. He's, he knew David back in the early days, back in the Gibeah days. He said, David, he goes, this is really, this just kind of makes you mad, but it's just how life works. Abner comes to David after Saul gets killed and says, uh, you know, uh, you know when Samuel prophesied over you? And David goes, yeah. He goes, uh, we all believed it the whole time. We know you're the guy. David says, well, Abner, that's good, but why were you guys trying to kill me? He goes, well, we'd lose our jobs if we didn't try to kill you. It wasn't personal. Well, you know, Saul's really angry guy. I mean, you know, David, he would kill us. We, I mean, David, we knew you were the anointed of the Lord. They always knew he was the anointed of the Lord. That's an interesting concept, isn't it? Because Abner told him that at the end. He says when he's bargaining with him, he goes, we always knew. It was clear to everybody. So Ishbosheth is the only obstacle, and everybody in the 12 tribes knows David's the anointed one. So there's, there's absolutely nothing between him and being king of Israel. Nothing. Zero. The guys are so excited. They say, David, this is that, this is that. David goes, well, wait a second, guys, you don't understand. I don't really want to be king. I mean, I'll be king if I have to be king. That's not really what I'm about. I'm a poet, and I'm a lover. I love the word of God. I, I, I'm going to die in a few days. That's what he says in Psalm 39. He goes, my life is a vapor. I'm going to be gone in a moment. He goes, I'm going to be before the God of the universe. He goes, I'm lost in love. He goes, I'll be king if I have to be king. But that's not really what I'm about. They go, David, what are you talking about? He goes, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go have a prayer meeting. They go, oh, no, no, don't do one of those prayer meetings, David. <laughs> don't do a prayer meeting. And David does a prayer meeting. He goes in verse chapter 2, verse 1, and he asks the Lord, he goes, should I go up? And the guys are going, don't ask that question. What if God says no? And God says, yeah, I'll go up, but only go up over one-twelfth, only over Hebron. Not over 12 of the tribes, only one of them. Only take one tribe, Judah. He says, I don't want to give you the other 12 tribes right now, the other 11. So he comes out of the prayer meeting. He goes, guys, guess what? We're going up. They go, oh, praise God. He says, J just over Judah. 
The other 11 we're not going to take. They said, Ishbosheth, we can take him out today. No, no, that's not the point. I, I don't want to be over the 11. Abner, they, they already know you're the anointed. They'll go with you. They're political. They'll buy in in a minute. No, no, guys, you don't understand. I'm not, that's not what I do. I'm a lover. That's who I am. I love God. That's what I'm about. So he goes, I'm just going to Hebron. So for seven years, he only is over one. Twelfth. Seven years in the desert. Seven years chased. He's been believing these prophecies for 14 years now. He has seven more years to go. Sounds like Jacob, doesn't it? Labor. Fourteen long years. Sounds like Joseph. You're going to be over your brothers. Then he's in the pit. Then he's over Potiphar's house. Then he's in the pit again. It just keeps going up and down. God's building an identity in his people. These guys for seven long years. They said seven years we were with you in the Adullam years, seven years in the Hebron years. David, it's 20 years now. It's 20 years. You're going to be old one of these days. You've got to enter into your promises. David says, I'm not worried about the promises. God found me in Bethlehem. He had my address then. He can get a hold of me in Hebron a lot easier than Bethlehem. I'm not about being king. I'm about gazing on the beauty of the Lord and seeking the face of God. Psalm 27, the statement of David's life. Finally, Ishbosheth dies. Seven years later, David's 37. Now he goes to Jerusalem. 37 years old, 20 years later. But he goes to Jerusalem as a man whose identity is in being loved and a lover, a man that's gazing, a man that's captured. He's one of the only safe kings in the whole history of the world because he knew where his joy was. He knew where his power was. Yes, we know the grievous sin he did with. He wasn't sinless there. But from age 37 to 70, those 33 years, I mean, the glory of the Lord touched that nation in victory after victory and strength. And people loved the Lord. And the tabernacle of David was built. And the worship of God filled the land. And David couldn't get distracted from it in a major way. Yes, he did some sins. He counted the nation, the number, he counted Israel at the very end in pride. But it wasn't the rule of his life. David wasn't sinless because of this identity. But David was safe as a leader before God's people. And he could lead people into this before the Lord. And that's what the book of Psalms is all about. People talk about David being the greatest military leader in history. David was the greatest lover of history is what he was. Look at the book of Psalms. Military is fine. He was a lover of God. That's going to live forever in the heart of God. Amen. Let's stand. Lord, we love you. I have Brenda come up. Lord wants some of you to get lost in the beauty of the Lord. Now we're going to, again, we're going to look at these Psalms, a number of them, one by one, and open up some of the most glorious things that David saw. I just trust that the Lord will touch our hearts with them. They are glorious as they're written in the Psalms. Lord, we're yours. God, we want to be a man or a woman with a heart like yours. So what season are you in right now? Are you in Gibeah? Are you in a time where the things are going good? Are you in Hebron where it's kind of good but not as good as it's supposed to be? Are you in the Adullam years right now? Are you in the Bethlehem years where the promises are just coming and the Lord is romancing you for the first time? Where are you at? Wherever you're at, I know what the will of God is. That you would find your identity in being loved and a lover. Find your enjoyment. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.